Hi. Hello and welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken. I am Lady Glockenflecken. And we're so excited for you to be with us today. We have a wonderful guest who's yeah. an artist and a physician. And uh, his name is Dr. Mike Natter. Super cool stuff that We've he does. Following him on social media for quite a while. And uh, so we'll talk about talk to him here in a bit. But before we do that, we are, it is May. Mm-hmm. And this is the post-match a uh, pre-graduation time period for med students. Yes. So they have matched, which means that they all know where they're going next year to start residency, mm-hmm. but they have not graduated yet. This is the prime time for ophthalmology rotations. Some of them may be graduating like imminently. Yeah, it's like happening this month. Yeah. It's it's uh but they that that the like two months, that two and a half months. Yeah, that's a real sweet spot. Oh, it's great. It, yeah. it, Cause you can uh you just check out. Yeah, you can do a do a in quote unquote research elective. That's <laughs> I think that's what I, one of the things Where you I research did. research your moving and, costs. <laughs> and you just yeah, you just try not to think about the fact that you're still paying thousands of dollars in tuition for these like two months that are really you know, don't offer much in the way of education, nor should mm. they, because everybody should be taking a break. What were we doing in those two months? I mean, I was still working. I and what were you doing? Don't, you don't even, even remember. Know. We I, were probably planning our move. I think there were some parties involved. Oh, probably, yeah. Uh, I do remember one specific med school party where everybody burned their notes because we all had paper notes still. This was how... Yeah. Old I am. Oh, that's right. I wasn't working. We, I was. We had a little tiny baby. That's right. We did I was doing that. And so there was a note burning party. Right. I remember that a big bonfire. Big bonfire, mm-hmm. and a lot of people burn their white, their short white coats oh. as well. I am glad Seems I did a... because it became an integral part of my <laughs> that's of right. my costume. Yeah. Uh, wardrobe. Ten years later. <laughs> <laughs> so Who saw that I probably wore in that coat in more videos than anything else in uh, my closet. Yeah. That thank you for devoting the closet to my. It was painful. I have a whole closet for my props. With. That's great. I love it. It's good. I mean, considering our our actual clothes closet, you've taken over like that is more not than true. half. That of is it. half and half. Eh. Half and half. Yeah. Fifty. It's up for debate. 50. I don't know about that. We're gonna have to post a picture. Let the people decide. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk to Dr. Mike Natter and stop talking about uh, our, our, <laughs> our closet our closet arguments. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Natter is a clinical assistant professor of medicine and a clinical endocrinologist. He is a doctor, an artist, a humanist, overall just wonderful patient advocate and physician. Uh, and um, uh, he's on uh, Instagram and and. Twitter, he'll tell you where he's where where to find yeah, him. Yeah, and but... he's a good model for kind of a, a non traditional path to medical school exactly. and through medical school. He's done some really cool things and really fascinating, uh, you know, educator in terms of learning through art. And uh, he talks a little bit about that. So really yeah. fun conversation. Let's get to it. Here is Dr. Mike Natter. <laughs> All right, we have Dr. Mike Natter. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. It's it's thank really you. it's really a pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you guys. So uh, you know, the, I I've been following you on Twitter uh, for for actually quite a while now, yeah, like long going time. back. I don't know, probably pretty soon after I first started on Twitter. And, yeah. And I just remember seeing your um, your drawings and your art and being like, oh, that's that's different. That's that's pretty cool. And um and that's something you've been doing. When did you like first start that part of your kind of I don't know what yeah. you call it. Is it a hobby? It's it's really a a big part of your career now it seems like. Yeah, yeah. So well, so first off, um the fact that you follow me at at any point <laughs> is uh quite an honor. Um massive fan um as of as are millions of people, I'm sure. Um so I I actually have been drawing my whole life. Um as I imagine you've always been funny your whole life or telling jokes your whole mm-hmm. life. It's just kind of like kind of something natural for us, I, I would imagine. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I believe that all of us are, are born with some kind of creative or artistic tendencies. Um, you know, we all finger paint and draw and, and do all these fun things. And then something really sad happens and we stop. And I have a lot of reasons for why I think that is, but they're all terrible. Um, <laughs> like I we grow for... up, we grow up, <laughs> we become adults. Yeah. We have like day jobs we have to do. Is that what, is that what it is? Totally. And like, there's no RVUs apparently when, when you draw and you know, it's like the, the, what's valued point. in the world. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, reasons that I never really understood, I never stopped. I always continued yeah. to draw. So that kind of was with me my whole life. And, um, it, 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 it sparked a lot of my imposter syndrome when I wanted to go into medicine. Cause I thought, you know, how, how could I like an art kid make it in medicine? So, how did you make so, that decision yeah. to go to medicine, but, uh, to go to med school? What was that? So, process like yeah so i um i i have type 1 diabetes i was diagnosed when i was age nine um and i, I know you also have had um your share of of, of health concerns too um i i, I want to tell about. you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> um <laughs> i mean the way that i mean not to take it too much off of me but the way that you both have spun you know what i imagine is extremely traumatic experiences into such a really beautiful educational platform, but also, you know, find the humor in it, I think is really amazing um, and inspiring to me, myself, and I'm, and I'm sure millions of others. Um, well, a big part of that's just like kind of self-preservation, you know, which I'm sure you can probably relate to just, I I feel like I have to tell jokes and, and have that creative outlet just to mm -hmm. process. And I feel like things. I have to advocate and make the world a better place for other people. So you decide which one's better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like, that's a <laughs> right. It's a bit I'm of a power kidding. power couple. I mean, the, those are both <laughs> such, but they're such like healthy ways of of kind of coping. I tend to kind of rock in a ball and cry a lot. Is usually oh, like, okay. Um, yeah, right. that's step one. Uh, you gotta yeah. shed that once you you know, get out of training. Uh, eventually, you'll grow <laughs> out of that, but not completely. It's, it's there's still times in medicine where you will be crying in a ball, but. Um, you know, it's yes, it's true. <laughs> I, I started my attending career this past September and I have not shed that cocoon of, of shaking and crying so much. But yeah, you're you're right in it. You're right at the beginning here. This right is at the beginning. This is yeah. great. So so you are. Well, I, I want to actually uh, continue on and, and hear a little bit more about uh, about the combining the art with the, the medicine, because I, you know, as someone who has this for a long time i had this other hobby i was doing i did some stand-up comedy and it was separate from medicine and then uh you know at some point medicine gets it, your life as a doctor just gets yeah. too busy well and even you know outside of medicine i feel like there's this this push and pull of like you're either an artist type or you are a scientist type and at some point along the way it feels like you have to choose one if you have talents and both of those areas. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I was a victim of that. I didn't figure it out as well as you did. Um, you know, I went the science route because I do have that side. Um, and I didn't even think of myself as a creative person until I left the science field because I can't draw. I cannot draw to save my life. Stick figures are <laughs> all I can do. Um, but Better I me, do have though. other areas of creativity and, um, you know, artistry that I just didn't recognize as that, um, uh, because there's this like push and pull, right? So how did, did you, you feel that? Yeah. How yeah. did you, uh, combine the two? How did you know to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So I should go back a little bit. So, so I was diagnosed with type one diabetes, um, at age nine and that was the kind of initial introduction into medicine for me. And I was like, wow, this is really, really cool. You, you basically become your own pancreas. So it's something that was otherwise autonomous and that you kind of took for granted. You're, you're doing it yourself. So it, it sucked. Don't get me wrong. It, it still sucks, but it allowed me this kind of insight into, into pathophysiology and I gained that appreciation for it, but I was an art kid and I sucked at math and science and I had no medicine in my family. I never thought that I could be a doctor. I just, I thought I was not particularly bright, honestly. So it wasn't until I was in undergrad, I was studying art in undergrad and I had this kind of epiphany. I said, you know, I really want to try. And that way, if I try and fail, at least I won't have that regret if I didn't give it a shot. Um, so I, and I, I always felt like there was a lot of creativity in art in medicine and I thought that what I could bring to the table was actually something a little bit, you know, novel and potentially, you know, unique to, to helping folks. Um, I, it, it, it dawned on me in the application process that that wasn't readily apparent to most, uh, unfortunately. 
but I got very fortunate and did get in uh, to one of the 30 medical schools I applied to. So I was very fortunate for that. And it was in medical school when I was doodling my notes and I started to doodle on the kind of like the margins initially of these like typed up summaries, as I'm sure, you know, Will, I'm sure you remember, like people basically memorize these like volumes of text and then regurgitate them on tests. Right. And I, it's just ridiculous and the funny mnemonics and stuff. But I found when I would doodle and make these little comics or cartoons, they became stickier and I re recalled them for the test. And that's when I made that big leap when I said, you know what, let me try and switch out my notebooks for sketchbooks, see if I can retain this information in a better way that's more, you know, specific to me. And it, it worked and, and it worked for me for that didactic purpose. And it's been working for me to teach my patients and to teach, you know, my colleagues, and my med students. And, yeah, and did you have like a little side hustle of like drawing on flashcards and selling them <laughs> to your, to your I mean, that, other it's, students? It's funny you say that because there are a lot of uh, resources that med students use now. Yeah. That are picture related. Too late. You still can do that. Even, even I remember, uh, uh, I think it's like <laughs> some of the books that I had. And now we're talking, you know, this is back like 20, Shh. 2008, <laughs> 2009 or something. And there were uh, a couple of, I don't even remember what Long, they Longer ago. Ridiculously something like made, simple. Made, made ridiculously, ridiculously easy or something like that, right? Yeah. It was like microbiology yeah. or something. And yes. it, it had all these pictures in it and it was helpful. And so it makes it makes perfect sense, you know, that that it it helped you kind of retain some of this nonsense we have to we have to learn mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout med school. Yeah, it but did your I, mean, I really am curious, did your classmates come to you and and want to hear or want to see what you had come up with to help them study? It was a journey, actually. It was really funny. So I was very embarrassed and kind of ashamed that I was drawing because I was like, what if people see me as not taking this seriously? And, mm. you know, I'm in the library kind of doodling away. And I remember it was, I was a first year medical student. I was making this huge illustration and I went to the bathroom and that's the only time you would socialize because you were busy studying and then you'd go in the bathroom and there'd be someone next to you in the urinal. And I ran to my buddy <laughs> and he goes, uh, Natter, what, what are you, what are you doing? You're, you're drawing. Like, aren't you worried you're going to fail? And that's when I had this like sheer panic. I was like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? And like, they look at me, all these people. And then I did well on that test. And I said, oh no, something's here. And then I started to post them to social media, honestly, because I wanted a way, like a repository to save them for myself to study for step one and everything else. And my classmates would come up to me after tests and be like, Natty, you got me a couple points with that comic you drew. Oh, and I was nice. like, oh, so people are actually having some benefit from this. It was really nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I remember seeing, you know, periodically I'll see a little video that you'll take um, uh, of you teaching students, teaching you know, about the one I saw, I think it's your pinned tweet right now, uh, is you teaching the renin angiotensin aldosterone. Yeah, I, I remembered what R-A-A-S that, because you saw his uh, drawing. Yeah, it's because of that. Because of you. <laughs> I'd like I to know take that what credit, those but words you're a very intelligent ophthalmologist. Come uh, on. Now. <laughs> you don't give us too much credit as ophthalmologists. <laughs> but anyway, I, I uh, there was a wonderful video of you. Uh, you were drawing the system out. And I, I just like that's the type of education I think is, is really helpful, you know, whenever you're on these rotations. And do you still do you still do that with your now that you're the, the boss man, you're you're running rounds? For what? How long? Three or four hours? Is that typically? <laughs> we so have I to imagine use the it takes some time. <laughs> take, yes, take, your yeah. compression stockings. Take some time exactly. to do those draw. You have to draw your way through rounds. Uh, so it's going to take a few extra hours, I'm sure. No, it but can, it can. <laughs> Um, so as an endocrinologist these days, most of my practice is outpatient. Um, I get to attend on the on the on the service uh, two weeks of the year, which I really enjoy, and I do try to draw a lot for the the fellows and the residents. Then, but what I found is, um, and I believe this firmly, and this comes partially from being a patient. I really believe that every patient has the right to understand the pathophysiology of their disease. I, I really mean that, and and I think especially when you're dealing with chronic conditions like diabetes and others. A lot of how the outcomes are, are dependent on the patient's, uh, you know, kind of agency and if they're going to take care of themselves. And I think if they understand what's wrong at that level, they're, they're more likely to take care of it. And when you draw to explain, you've broken down the educational barriers, the language barriers. I trained at, a, at, in, at NYU in Bellevue and Bellevue is like a very special place. It's like the city hospital of New York. And we, we treat people from all different walks of life who don't have you know, assent to their name or don't speak the language or don't have citizenship, which is a really beautiful thing to be able to help anyone. 
And when there's that language barrier or an educational barrier or a cultural barrier, you've flattened all that when you draw something and you create that rapport. And even if the drawing is not great, that process you took really connects you to that patient. And oftentimes I'll draw what look like scribbles and they'll want to take that home at the end of the visit, which is really magical. Yeah. Do you have an education background? Because I've seen you, you know, in some of these videos, you're drawing and you're teaching at the same time. And you seem like kind of a natural educator. So is that something that's in your family or that you've seen or been trained in somewhere? Thank you for that. That's a big compliment. Um, My mom's an elementary school teacher. She's retired. Okay, there it is. Uh, So I think that might be part of it. (laughs) But I also think growing up and not being very smart, like I didn't excel academically. And so I like to break things down to a child's understanding. And if you can do that, then anyone can understand it. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah. I wish I I mean, it makes me wish I was a better artist. I know. I really. I need you to draw are... some eyeballs for me. How's your? I got eye- you. How, how's your eyeball these days? You got a good eyeball going. I can make some. You know, it's I actually complicated have... anatomy. It's 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 sometimes it's it's hard to you know we have plenty of models in the so I use those which is you know uh, that's probably better three dimensional. <laughs> I actually I was a I was a, um, a a bad Jonathan. I was a uh, yeah. like the, the evil Jonathan. That was me uh, oh, in my okay. in my. I did a post back. I think we might actually be very similar in age. To be honest with you, I don't want to ask, but I think we're there. I'm, I'm a lot I'm, older. I'm than... thirty seven. You can ask. I'm thirty seven. I'm, thir- I'm thirty seven as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Nice. So I I took a weird roundabout. So I did my art school, and then I did a post back pre med program, and then it took me some time to get in. And in that interim, I worked as a medical assistant to a corneal transplant surgeon. And I was his scribe and, you know, assistant and I was horrible, (laughs) just terrible. It was embarrassing how bad I was, but I can still remember most of the layers of the cornea. So I got that. So you you were, so were you going to the operating room? Were you doing, were you there like for everything just in clinic? You were scribing, we, we, you know, you're probably weren't as bad as you think you were. Uh, It was pretty bad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the problem, the hard thing about my field is that it, the our language is is ridiculous. so different. Ridiculous, yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the fact that glockenflecken is an actual thing in ophthalmology, right. uh, you know, it's which is the reason I chose it in the first place. So I always, uh, anytime I'm working with like a new scribe or we have new scribes in our clinic, it's, uh, you know, it's always a learning curve, uh, you know. But so yeah, I think, you know, maybe if you had just drawn everything instead of, tried to spell out these terrible words, you know, <laughs> it, it would have been a little bit easier for you. Oh, OS and OD still plague me to this day, but I'll get there one day. <laughs> OD, it, it's, it's, it's simple. OD is the right eye. The other one is the other one. That's... Yeah. <laughs> but then you got to throw an OU in there and then you got GTTs and all these. I mean, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> they just like to feel important. They it, make it overly it complicated. So I didn't go into, uh, back to, you know, endocrinology and your job now. I didn't realize that it was... I guess it makes sense that it's so outpatient heavy, uh, but I guess I was surprised that you're that you don't have to spend as much time on the inpatient side of things. Um, and so, is there like a, a service? Uh, I'm assuming there's a consult service, and and you have you know fellows and and residents kind of rotate through there. Mm-hmm. Do you like that balance of outpatient and inpatient that you have? It's funny. So like my residency was so intense um, and I was just so burnt out that I thought coming into the outpatient world, I'd be like, oh, what a relief. But you just trade one for the other. You know, it's, you know, the my chart messaging and, yeah. and the results that come in and, and all that stuff. It's it's exhausting. But I found I do miss a lot of the inpatient medicine. Um, there's something really nice about seeing a problem in front of you, having that cognitive space to figure it out and then solve it right then and there. And you, you kind of feel the benefit of that. It doesn't happen all the time in internal medicine, but, you know, like in the, in the unit or here and there, you're able to kind of, you know, see the result of, of, of your, of your work. Outpatient endocrine, it's a little bit of a slow go. I get very excited when I see the A1C drop. Don't get me wrong. Like very yeah. excited. We have a little party <laughs> in the room, but uh, it could take time. <laughs> Do you find that being, um, a patient and specifically a patient of, you know, in, within your own field, do you find that helps you be a better doctor? I do. I do. I don't think you have to have, you don't have to share the affliction with the patient to be empathetic. I, I believe that sure. firmly, Yeah. but it definitely helps with a chronic condition. Cause like I said, the patient needs to take ownership and take care of themselves. And so, you know, I won't always upfront share that with the patient, but then when the patient comes in and I say, Oh, what were your, you know, finger stick glucose checks, you know, and like, well, doc, I didn't do it. No, well, why not? Like, what's the barrier? 
because you don't understand. It hurts. It hurts to prick my finger. And I said, yeah. mm, I do. I do. And I've been <laughs> doing it for, you know, 20 whatever years now. Um, and that that palpably shifts the dynamic in the room when mm -hmm. they understand that you really do get it because you do it too. And I always make right. that clear that just because, you know, I'm telling you to do something doesn't mean it's not difficult or annoying, but it's for your benefit. And I can tell you that I do it as well. And that makes me, I think, a little bit more of an understanding physician. Yeah, I think that's so powerful, you know, across the board of just under just recognizing what they're going through and letting them know that you see that and you understand that whether you experience it yourself or not just to be to feel like you've been seen and heard as a patient or as a you know a co-patient co-patient um i think that is sometimes that's all it takes it's so powerful and it can really change the the course of action that they take afterward absolutely within the next few years i'm going to be in reading glasses and then I'll I'll be able then you'll to, be able to empathize be with able your patient. Yeah, the vast majority. He's of had like my perfect patients. vision his whole life, like eagle eyes. So yeah, I'm the so you know, you have your experience as a type one you know diabetic, and and I I have never worn glasses. I actually have never had like a dedicated eye exam. Isn't really? that isn't that yeah. weird? And that yeah, you it's, should it's, feel you've never been, it's not great. Like you've I, never been dilated. Uh, I I had one of my eyes dilated in I just, med school. I, in med school, mm -hmm. yeah. No, in residency. Mm -hmm. It was in residency. Um, so, <laughs> which is a little bit embarrassing. I can't Everyone, feel free to publicly shame. I him. can't believe he I'm saying it. this on I know, a podcast you're admitting now. It. Uh, but yeah, it's it's um you know so I've I've never had to yeah. wear glasses let's dilate and... your eyes see how you I was like say, it i feel like i feel like this is a great opportunity for Kristen to dilate you in your oh, clinic yeah. have it filmed this could be a great educational yes. episode oh that's a great oh, idea that's, that's that's a good take point. my revenge because i hate having my eyes oh, it's the, I mean, worst. the dilating yeah. it hurts like i have very light eyes or sensitive to light as it is and then when you dilate them it's even worse and it stays that way for like way longer than it's supposed to but he's always complaining at me to go get my eye exam go get my eye exam mm -hmm. so. I mean, you gotta you know, do it you're no stranger to eye exams you know right you you Correct. go for your yearly i get my yearly dilated exam Thankfully, and no cotton wool spots. No. <laughs> That's great. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Actually, uh, you you sent us a, a few stories, and one of them involves um, <laughs> an, a, an eyeball and and an exam of the eyeball. So I'd mm -hmm. love for you to tell everyone about that. Ooh, yeah. This was um, so so part of I think what makes me a little bit of a non traditional medical person is I I tend to wear my shortcomings on my sleeve. Um, I think we in medicine are take this idea of perfection a little far and people don't kind of speak about things that they don't feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I was the opposite in med school. I would kind of poke fun at the ridiculousness of things I did. <laughs> Love it. Um, Love so it. I, um, I was, I think, I think third year medical school was like some of the most dehumanizing, like most awkward experience um, of my life. You basically are six to eight weeks in a rotation where by the end of it, you're just starting to understand the lingo and then you switch and do it all over again and you just feel like a total idiot the whole time. Um, so this was not, this was uh, the case on my neurology exam, on uh, my uh, rotation rather. I was rotating in Philly where I did my med school and I was in a clinic setting and I was convinced that this patient had pseudotumor cerebrii. I was sure of it. And one of the things I recall from actually one of my comics that I drew from step one was that they get this papilledema-like uh, situation in the back of the eye uh, from, from I, I guess, from the high ICP. Mm -hmm. So I told the attending as I was presenting, you know, I believe this is on the differential. And he says, well, did you look at her eyes? I said, no, I haven't. He goes, go take a look. So meanwhile, while I'm trying to examine her eyes, he's got his back to us typing up his note. She's on the exam table. And I went to the wall and I didn't have my own ophthalmoscope because why would I? It's too expensive. And I was like, I'm not smart enough to get into opto. So we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I grab what I believe is the ophthalmoscope and I'm, you know, I'm doing what I recall doing, but I was trained where I have my right hand and I'm on the, I'm on their right side and all this stuff. And I can't seem to see anything like nothing. And I turn around, I said, you know, attending, I, I can't seem to visualize the, uh, the fundus there. I'm having a difficult time. And he goes, yeah, because maybe you're using the otoscope to look at her eyeball. <laughs> and Oopsie. I had the wrong scope. <laughs> that one's for ears. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> I now know that, unfortunately, a little late. But <laughs> so that well, was you know, it's it's funny because that that's a big area of um, 
uh, anxiety for a lot of non-ophthalmologists is just being able to look back there. And so, you know, chances are your neurology attending probably wasn't much better at it than you were, just to be honest. So well, it's, it's uh, probably true. It's probably yeah. why he had you do it. I, I, <laughs> it's, uh, that's right. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I love that. Uh, I think I actually made a video like it's very similar to that because I have seen that happen before. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I mean, they're both that makes similar. me feel a little better. They they, they look kind of the same, you know. It's it's you can't really see much of anything with either of them whenever you're a med student, uh, you know, in particular. So I can, uh, you know, yeah, easy mistake to make. I, I bet that neurology attending is also still talking about that to this day. So. <laughs> Remember that idiot. <laughs> I, it's funny because I, you know, whenever I talk to non-ophthalmology audiences in medicine, sometimes I occasionally I'll talk about eyeball things and I always tell them like, we have no expectations for anybody outside of ophthalmology being able to see into the back of the eye. Like it's, you know, for the same reason, you know, I wouldn't, no, no med student should ever buy an ophthalmoscope. Like that's because it's just, it's a difficult exam. It's, it's really hard to like, to learn, to master and, and uh, I think the future is probably a, a camera that will actually take a picture of the fundus, like in yeah. every mm. in every office. That would be so much better for the patient too. I feel like. Well, they, well they I don't do know. Maybe you still them. have to have the bright lights and stuff. They on have the camera. them now, but but more for the benefit of the like physicians outside of ophthalmology. Right yeah, now, yeah, the, yeah. all those cameras are in ophthalmology clinics, and well, know. that's what ultrasound is for. Come on, you know that's uh oh, that's a hot topic. <laughs> yeah, on yeah, that's, that's... <laughs> that was a cheap shot. Yeah. That's what, that's exactly. Well, I, well, attendings can be really intimidating sometimes, and especially when you're like a little baby M three, right? Because that's the first time that you are in a clinical setting where you're expected to kind of know things, and they're they're asking you things. I think you have a story about that too. Oh, your boy. surgery rotation. Oh my God. Yeah. The only time I think my entire uh, medical journey where I thought, you know what, I'm just quitting. I'm done. <laughs> this is not for me. <laughs> oh, I, it, this was my very first clinical rotation. Um, oof, yeah, this was a rough go. So I, I was scared out of my mind. I was waking up at like three, four in the morning to go into my surgery rotations. Um, and I get there and, uh, there is a notorious, uh, attending at this particular lo uh, location that apparently, I didn't know this going into it, but apparently loves to kind of pick one of the medical students and just make their life hell for those six weeks. And oh, no. I was the lucky, <laughs> the lucky one. Oh, no. I was in, in a, uh, long, some, some abdominal surgery. And, um, as you know, that, that my job primarily was just the retracting. So I was just retracting. Um, and I was exhausted. Uh, you know, you've been there since four or five in the morning and the surgery is going on forever and you're not being included in any of the surgery. You're just being there as a, as basically like a, a door holding stop. the door open. You're, so you're holding it open <laughs> and it's, it's several hours in one position and you're, you're scrubbed four, in your forearms are aching. You're trying to like dissociate mentally to, 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 <laughs> to keep yourself, uh, you know, from just collapsing. And so I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I think we've all had those experiences in med school. Exactly. And this, this surgeon um, who had a, a slight accent and spoke very softly was looking down in the surgical field and mumbled under his breath between his mask, um, what space am I in? And I had no, I, I didn't hear him at all as I was dissociating, as you so aptly <laughs> noted. <laughs> and um, I didn't say anything. And then he stops, he looks at me and he goes, I said medical student, because that was my name, medical student at the oh, time. Yes. What space am I in? And I said, oh, Jesus. And I had to like, ooh. So let me backtrack and think, okay, you're through like the fascias and the carpet. There's like fascial. I'm like, ooh. And I was like, and I, I was kind of, I didn't want to sit there in silence. So I went through my thought process out loud thinking, you know, at least he'll know that I'm not That's a just, good strategy. Yeah. That's, That's a good strategy. Thought. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, you're through this part of the fascia, right? And he goes, did you just ask a question in my OR? And I was like, ooh, he says, I'm the only one that asks questions in this OR. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. Like, it's amazing how this is oh, seared yeah. into yeah. my hippocampus here. Don't be this person, Those everyone. Those never leave you. Yes. <laughs> never leave you. And it got to the point where I was like, I think you're in the, um, what did I say? I think you're in the, um, uh, oh my gosh, now I'm blanking on it. It was the, what did I say? Peritoneum. Yes. I was like, I think you're in the peritoneum. Oh, I love that you knew that. And he <laughs> that's goes, the only space, the only space inside the abdomen. I know there are other, it, apparently there are other types the, of spaces. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, neither did I, nor do I now. And I said, uh, yeah, per, I said peritoneal space. And he said, wrong. 
what space am I in? I said, oh God. So he, he like puts his tools down. He's kind of like coming closer to me at this point. I'm feeling kind of threatened. And he says, you know, my chief resident said that he thinks that I intimidate you. And I was like, oh my God. And he's like, so what is it? Do I intimidate you? And he like leans in closer. I'm like, what is I'm like, with this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Really crazy. So I, at this point, I have totally just like made a mess of my scrubs. I'm like totally like peeing myself out of fear. And I, I was like, I just don't, I don't know what to say. And he goes, I'm in the pre peritoneal space. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh okay. gosh. Pre And that was that. Uh, yeah. Mm. So that was that. Uh, that was a miserable well, six weeks of my fun. life. So you decided not to go into surgery. Yeah, that was it, it was a big off my list. I, I will say I thought for a moment I might like a procedural field because of my artistic background. I I don't think I could live that lifestyle. It's a crazy lifestyle. Yeah. It really is there, um, you know, and it's it's far different than like I knew I didn't want it either because I did seven weeks of vascular surgery for oh, my God. surgery rotation. So very similar experience, but my attendings were not nearly as as toxic as as yours were i just had to like suffer through wearing like 20 pounds of lead <laughs> you know in the or for like five or six hours behind a couple trash cans that it was... worked out though it's the reason he chose ophthalmology yeah oh. that's true because you know i immediately went to ophthalmology i did a two-week elective in ophthalmology right after my co- core surgery rotation and the first day they offered me a, a, a stool to sit on that was, and that was it. That was, that it. was it. That that was <laughs> that, my decision was made. I was like, oh, I can because I liked I liked the operating room. I liked being there. I liked surgeries, but um, I I, I love sitting down too much. That's so you, I mean, so you so... didn't come in. You didn't come into med school. No. You weren't like oh opto all the way. You came in. You're like I like procedures. I like surgery. Yeah. I I well I, think I, you I were learned pretty that. undecided. I was totally. Yeah. I was an undifferentiated med student. Mm-hmm. I was completely, and so. You know, just trying to f- feel my way through it, see what what I, I really clicked with, and most things I was pretty sick of by the time the rotation ended, uh, and was ready to move on to something else. And then, you know, but uh, in ophthalmology, it was only two weeks, so you didn't have time to get sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're sitting, so it's great. But ophthalm, I will say, ophthalmology is not the most comedy heavy specialty. So, you know, I I think uh, you know gastroenterology or urology would have would have probably been a little bit better on the comedy front but uh you know a lot of low hanging fruit in those yeah <laughs> <laughs> I make it work um and so you did all your 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 education and training in new york is that right no i did my med school in philly oh you said um, you're in philly That's yeah right. I, had, I had a really wonderful medical school experience uh, outside of that one <laughs> that one time but uh very very grateful I, I went to jefferson medical college very very grateful for that opportunity um, and then I'm from New York City, so I went home. I did my residency and fellowship at NYU and Bellevue for the last five years. And tell me about your intern year. Do you because because it's obviously notoriously the most challenging year of of uh, residency. With the hospital you were in was was community hospital. It, it was a community like. hospital, right? And, and city hospital, in New York. Of, yeah. So like kind of a safety net yes. type hospital. Um, and so I imagine the, the breadth and volume of, of patients you were, you were seeing was pretty wild. Is that right? I saw, I saw the spectrum. Yeah, I'm very grateful for it. And, and like I said before, really, really an honor to work there. But there would always be a couple of interesting kind of things that would crop up like yeah. working in those environments for sure. Um, I, I think you might be alluding to one of my other stories. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and it's just... I've never heard of anybody being asked to do something like this in <laughs> in any level of of medical training or education. Um, and so I, I have to have to have you tell this story. Sure. Yeah. I, I, it takes scut work to like the next level. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of my hesitations of coming back to New York to do my training was there's a lot of horror stories about what is expected of the interns. Um, and I had to kind of get over that fear, but I went ahead and I said, you know what, I really want to get the best training I can and I want to be back home in New York. So I went for it and I have no regrets, but, um, some of the things were intense. So I remember very vividly as a beginning of my intern year, um, my first rotation actually was in the ICU, which was horrifying, but also a very good experience. And then that was my second intern year rotation. That's right. I was actually just listening to your episode with uh, Dr. Silverman. I remember you were talking about that. 
terrifying. It's brutal. It's, ter- it's terrifying. <laughs> it's, terrifying. It's, a, yeah. it's a tough way to start for sure. You were under the under the desk having a little snooze, right? Uh, under the desk <laughs> having a snooze. A Where else are you going to be? Because <laughs> if you go any further away, then people will start dying, and it'll be all your fault. That's mm-hmm. that's the uh, the nonsense mentality of an intern starting. So. Oh, no, I had the same. I still have that mentality. But yeah, <laughs> uh, so I, I was on Night Float, which um, is is for those that aren't as familiar with, uh, with the system. Basically, you are expected to cover upwards of like 60 to 70 patients. You just get these huge lists of patients with a couple lines written about them. And you carry like 18 pagers and just don't sleep. And, you know, most of it's a lot of like, you know, Tylenol and blood yeah. sugar stuff, like, you know, very, very manageable uh, every once in a while, there's a rapid response or a code, but then every once in a while, there is a task that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And um, I was getting my sign out, which uh, the day teams were giving me. And I remember I forgot my buddy's name at the time, but he said, Nat, I'm really sorry, um, but there's something you'll have to do for this patient. The patient is currently under uh, NYPD or, or uh, the police department custody. Uh, they're chained to the bed down in the emergency room. They're admitted to medicine. But uh, they may have swallowed a few baggies or many baggies of drugs. Um, they're refusing imaging, but you need to um, basically um, sift through their stool uh, yeah. if they have a bowel movement to ensure that the baggies are still encased and not had you know burst open, which would be a bit of an emergency. Um, and he handed me, I don't know if he was serious or not, but he handed me a set of chopsticks. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I think oh. it was a joke, but I think he was like, you know, this, you know, this could be helpful. But maybe and... not a joke. <laughs> I mean, um, maybe so that's that was... all they had. So, <laughs> so I went, I, I did a, I did a set of rounds that night and I, I remember going to the bedside of the gentleman. And I said, sir, for the love of God, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, please. At 7 a.m. and after, you have all the bowel movements you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So that was an evening. Did Did you ever oh, have boy. to use those chopsticks? You know, surprisingly, um, he, he, did, <laughs> he did pass stool, but it was um, diarrhea and uh, there was yeah. nothing in it. And I was <laughs> uh, spared, <laughs> oh, my spared the experience. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh. Oh, man. Okay, well, I don't know who came on after you at 7 a.m., but they probably have a very different story. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be right back with Mike Natter. Hey, Kristen, do you know why a stethoscope is so difficult to use? Because there's no heartbeat in an eyeball. That's actually a really good point. But also, the heart is quiet. The mm. sounds can be distant, and you're in a noisy environment trying to listen to all the beeps and boops. Mm. Uh, but with Echo Health's 3M Litman Core Digital Stethoscope, it's easier than ever. You get 40 times sound amplification, active background noise cancellation. Even an ophthalmologist could hear the heart. Yeah, you know, I really could have used that before I had to do 10 minutes of CPR. And it leads to earlier detection, better outcomes. Definitely something that's personally meaningful for us. We have a special offer for our U.S. listeners. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O health slash K-K-H and use NOC50 to get $50 off plus a free case plus free engraving with this exclusive offer, which ends April 30th. We have a new podcast in the Human Content Podcast family. That's right. It's called Hidden Stories with host Andy Jiang. It's, it's fantastic. So Andy is a storyteller. Uh, he's all over social media. He's got like over 3 million TikTok followers, over a million YouTube subscribers, uh, a ton of uh, views on YouTube. It's just really interesting stuff. Uh, addicting viral stories. It's just like you can't stop watching his content. It's, it's And they're it's true fantastic. stories. So. And he's going long form because like all the other stuff is kind of more short form. Uh, and so he's going long form on a podcast. Uh, and so uh, we're excited for this. It's it's launched recently. And so you can go check it out and subscribe on any podcast app or on his YouTube channel. Uh, and um, you can hear the world's most incredible tales through these captivating depictions and investigative research. Yeah, Fantastic. stick around to the end of the episode and we'll show you the trailer. Yeah. So welcome to the family, Andy. <laughs> All right, we are back with Dr. Mike Netter, uh, endocrinologist uh, extraordinaire. You just what? had a little Freudian slip it, there. You said my, Netter. Nat, 
I thought I said natter. You, now, you know, how, you said natter. How many netter. times have you gotten that? By the way, like I'm sure people get the vowel wrong. I I like to. I mean, it's it's the highest of compliments because I mean that guy was the master of of illustration. So yeah. I, I would love to be. Uh, but no, it happens every now and again. I get yeah. people usually mispronounce it with D's. They usually call me nader. Um, oh but really? I get, I get netter every once in a while. That's one I don't correct. I'll let that slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it fit. For those of you unaware, uh, netter was his name. Mike? Why are you looking at Frank, me? Uh, I don't know. Frank, Frank, Frank Netter. That's right. Frank Netter uh, has he's like historically one of the most famous uh, medical artists out there. Just because I don't think he's alive anymore, is he? No, he passed. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think like five, six years ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. but he he illustrated this entire atlas that pretty much every doctor on Earth uh, knows about at this point. See, that's so crazy to me. You said you you know you didn't feel like you were smart enough or that art you know, in medicine that people wouldn't take you seriously. But then like medicine 101 basically is this book full of illustrations. So that's that's true. Kind of ironic. It's very visual. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell us, uh, just give, give us a, a one or two liner on like what endocrinology is. We'll start it's there. A, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like when people ask what I do, I say I'm a doctor, and then they ask what field. And if they're not in medicine, I say endocrinology. Most people have no idea what right. it is. And you know, if you say gastroenterology or ophthalmology, people know what that is. So it's always it interesting. So I tend to ask them, I'm like, what do you think it is? And they always come up with these funny, funny things. But I, I say it's uh, it's metabolism um, and hormones. But that often gets missed as you know misunderstood. So I usually say I deal with things like diabetes pituitary issues, thyroid issues, um, you know, osteoporosis somehow found its way into our bag. Hmm. Um, you know, different, different types of things. You know, sometimes we have a little bit of a turf war with, um, you know, the, the, the nephrologist. Sometimes, you know, we, Hmm. we talk about certain things with like diabetes insipidus or, um, different things kind of get overlap, but the most of what I do bread and butter is going to be diabetes and thyroid is kind of the bulk of it. A little bit of adrenal, a little bit of, um, pituitary, a lot of PCOS, um, but it, it kind of spans a lot of different things. Uh, I mean, turf war, I, I don't think I've ever like seen an, an angry or irritated endocrinologist in my life. So I feel like you guys are, uh, <laughs> on the We're nicer, very, nerdy, very nerdy, very nice bunch. Yeah. <laughs> so what I thought we could do is, you know, I usually like to play a little game, uh, and I did prep you briefly, like, like la- late last night. You were probably already asleep. So I, I love not giving my guests enough time to <laughs> to actually prepare for something like this. But uh, I call it the six degrees of endocrinology. So, mm-hmm. you know, everybody know like there's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So like, like everybody is within six degrees of Kevin Bacon in terms of some kind of connection. Right. So we're going to do six degrees of endocrinology because I, I don't have a lot of understanding of endocrinology, but it does uh, seem like almost everything in the human body is connected in some way to endocrinology. So I'm going to give you an anatomic structure in the body. I had to do a significant amount of research because I, there's a lot of things I don't know about anatomic structures in the body. So I came up with a handful of things and I'm going to just give you something and I want you to relate it to endocrinology in some way. Okay. Fair enough. And we got to count enough. how many degrees it takes. Oh, that's right. We'll see how quickly you can get these. Okay. Some oh, of them man, will be easy. Some of the... So, yeah. So we'll start uh, with like a very obvious one. All right. Just to give an example. So retina. So the retina. So, so the retina, I mean, there's a number of things, but for me personally and professionally, I'd say diabetic retinopathy or, you know, diabetes would, would be related, I would assume. Perfect. Right. So there you go. That's one yes. degree. One degree. Got it. Very closely right. related. Let's, uh, let's go with tibia tibia well we could do one degree again and say osteoporosis theoretically so there's mm. something there how, does how, osteoporosis? Yeah, how are those related it, uh, you said osteoporosis is part of your field but how so yes so the tibia is a bone i i hope i think i believe um <laughs> i think you're right Don't i think, ask I think us. you're right yes <laughs> <laughs> rather important um, one it, yeah it does it does things downstairs there and um osteoporosis so the bone exists in a state of building up and breaking down um, that's like a normal state there's a build up part and a breakdown part and um, when that's disrupted and it's spending more time in that resorptive phase where it's breaking down then the bone mineral density is such that it's very fragile and it could break and so that's osteoporosis um, and so if someone had osteoporosis perhaps 
they had it in that area. Or I could also think of maybe like a rickets, which would be mm. like a vitamin D deficiency, which can cause that weakening of the bone. And it's usually in the lower limbs. So maybe that would be part of that. Go okay. That. All Did right. I pass? Did I get, I want all the, I want to, I want to honor that's, this rotation. No, here. That, you got extra credit. Good. What yes. is there? Is there a hormone that's involved in osteoporosis? So the, yeah, there's a bunch of hormones. So um, the main ones that I think about, there's a hormone called PTH. It was actually a very cleverly named hormone. Very few are cleverly named because it stands for <laughs> parathyroid hormone where it comes out of the parathyroid glands. Thank God for that, right? Um, and so that, that's, <laughs> that's going right, to regulate exactly. your blood calcium. Calcium comes from the bone. If you have too high PTH for reasons that we don't have to get into, it might leach that calcium from the bones, weakening them. So, Interesting. So tibia, PTH. osteoporosis, PTH. We'll say we'll do two. I think it's two two degrees of separation to I a, don't know. to a hormone. I haven't I haven't uh, the rules for this are very uh, you know are very vague. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's keep going here. All right, how about um, the skin? The skin. Oh, this is good. Um, okay, I'm going to say pretibial myxedema. Bless you. <laughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> those are words I I recognize those. You know those, yeah, yeah. So Pre-tibial, any, what now? Mixedema. 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 Yeah. M Y X. Oh. Edema. That's a fun word, actually. Mixedema. Something about fluid. That's all I know. Edema. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like a gnarly skin rash, um, usually in the lower limbs, um, associated with thyroid conditions. Um, so it's it's an autoimmune uh, thyroid condition that can cause a skin manifestation. Okay. So how many degrees would that? That's just still one degree. Still, Everything is very closely related. The endocrine so system far, is all around. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I really tried to... Okay. I got some harder ones coming up here. All right. Let's do... Um, also, you're getting these questions from an ophthalmologist. Yeah. You know, so. I, I do my best here. <laughs> the eye is the window to the entire body, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not quite. Um, <laughs> not, nor do I want it to be. All right. So how about the diaphragm? Ooh. The diaphragm, hmm, let's think, let's think, let's think. Okay, I'm going to say Kuzmal breathing from diabetic ketoacidosis is rapid shallow breathing, which the diaphragm would be a part of. Does nice. that count? Yeah. Yeah. And what then, that? is that two or one degree? So Kuzmal breathing and you said diabetic ketoacidosis? So Kuzmal breathing would be a symptom of diabetic ketoacidosis because you're trying to breathe off all of that acid. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. All right. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I thought that was going to yeah. really get him. Okay. The inner ear. Ooh, the inner ear. Oh, man. Cochlea, a... semicircular canals. Those are things you have the read about. The cochlear nerve. <laughs> Good job. I think so, that's... Oh, man. That's... Mm. <laughs> I got to think about this. Oh, good. You got one. There I you think go. I, I think I, I may have stumped Inner him. Inner ear. Well, I mean, there's Meniere's disease, but Meniere's disease is not really endocrine related. Mm-hmm. But is yeah. it related to something that is related to Oh, endocrine? yeah. So, okay. So we go Should all the way down go? to six degrees Because you, got, you oh. got six degrees to play with here. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. So, it doesn't have to be one-to-one. So, I'm going to keep mm-hmm. going here. Okay. So, I misunderstood the rules here. So, I'll say- It's okay. Say, it's my fault. <laughs> I'll say Meniere's disease, which is characterized typically by vertigo and tinnitus, or tinnitus, depending on who you ask. Um, and I'm going to say that vertigo is a dizziness that you would see if you're disoriented and dizziness and you had, I don't know, a pheochromocytoma. Oh, you might get you a little bit lightheaded. Well, you could get, a, mm, you don't really get dizzy from that, do you? Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take it back a step. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say thyroid storm causes a tachycardia, which could cause a lightheadedness, which could cause a dizziness, which could cause an inner, which it could be related, I suppose, to an inner ear. That's a really, mm, that's a soft <laughs> one. That's, yeah. that's, I think we'll accept it. It's like I, three, you did much three degrees, better than I'd be able three to or do. four. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, you got there. Eh, All right, debatable. <laughs> All right. How about um, how about hair? Oh, that's hair. actually more straightforward than than you would assume. Hypothyroidism. One of the major complaints I get, chief complaints I get, um, is uh, people coming in with uh, either brittle or loss of hair, and that could be from severe hypothyroidism. 
Um, or it could be from like an androgen driven, you know, like male pattern baldness kind of situation. So both what of about those. What about when you are pregnant and your hair texture just totally changes? Yeah. <laughs> Pregnancy is wild. It the, is the, wild. It's wild. The placenta makes all these crazy hormones and everything kind of goes out of whack, but it's kind of meant to go out of whack in a way. Right. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, um, I'm I, sensing that you might have had, is there some, are you having some hair? Did you have some hair issues with pregnancy? It changed a little bit. Yeah. Like it was, I well, I don't know. Part of it was just learning how to deal with curly hair other than just straightening the heck out of it. But it yeah, it made the the curl pattern a little bit looser than it had been before. Yeah, huh? That's fascinating. And my, my hair also changed too. Yeah, his so got gray. I just got gray. <laughs> but, but can I tell you, that's gray is children. good. Losing the hair is is not good, but going gray, yeah. I think, is a good look. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. A, people are. I I I've, oh, I was reminded. Uh, <laughs> I posted a a video like sometime in the last couple of weeks, and occasionally, like, I always read some of the comments and. And somebody was like, "I'm. It's sad. We're gonna watch this guy grow old." <laughs> Hopefully, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, it's have like, you heard about his health like, history? It's like, damn, that's, <laughs> that's, that's 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 very sad. Like, I I'm I'm going to age through my videos, assuming I keep doing it. Uh, yeah, uh, and but that's a beautiful thing. That's right. a wonderful thing. I guess. I mean, I've been BC alternative. Uh, that's right. I I hope I age. Uh, I, I can only imagine the comments. I mean, you have such a huge following. I mean, I have a, a fraction of the following that you have, but you could put out the most benign, like well intended post or skit or joke or comic. Yeah. And ninety nine percent of the people will love it, and there's just that one person, and that's all I think about is that one person. It's really terrible. There's always there's always somebody, and uh, you know maybe they had a bad day, maybe they're, I don't know, I, I you know it's, it, I try to like rationalize it in some way, like you know that's I don't know what this person's going through, but the fact yeah. that. The fact that it's ninety nine percent positive, right. you know, that's that's, that's what, what you have to pay attention to. Like, is the overwhelming opinion one thing, and then there's just this one person? And if so, that says more about that one person than it does actually about whatever they're saying about you. But it's it it, it can be hard. It, yeah, it's really sure. easy. I think our nature is to like you know focus in on the negativity and the the, the angry, upset people versus mm -hmm. the people that are really supporting you, but. I don't know. I feel like it's kind of a learned skill to like be able to block that stuff out. Yeah. Um, you probably don't get much of yeah. that. I mean, How could come you on. Possibly Ooh, get I, any? Got, I got a, yeah, I got a lot. I mean, I, I feel like when you have a platform, you like, I, I'm so honored to have it. I kind of backed into it through like by chance, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a responsibility. And so I do, I mean, like for instance, the, the platform you take against the, the evil corporations that run America, which is like the insurance companies and the PBMs right. and everything. It's like, yeah, we need to stick it to them. We need to kind of highlight that. And, you know, you've personally experienced that, but there's also millions of people that also don't have the platform that are experiencing that. So I, I feel, you know, I, I have views. I know people disagree with some of them and sometimes I use my platform for that. And, oh, I caught That's some, true. I caught some hate from that. <laughs> Yeah, and then in, in the 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 nature of social media today is that within 24 hours it's people kind move of, on. People you're move forgotten on. about. Yeah. yeah, that's the other yeah. thing, right? There might be one negative comment, but then you know, just come back tomorrow. <laughs> It'll all be all yeah, different. True, very true. All right, I have um, just like a couple more here, and okay, and before I d I haven't decided if I never do this type of game again or not but um <laughs> sometimes i come up with good ideas sometimes not so good but uh maybe i need to tweak it a little bit i don't know or explain the rules better or have some rules that that'd be good that might be a or good have start. a guest who's a little bit smarter than uh, me that uh, might be no, 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 no. You're, doing, you're doing great um i mean the the fact that you have to know so many all these different organ systems all these the really the, yes these pathways so complicated. and uh, it's, it's very complicated all right how about the lens this is a little harder one the lens. Ooh, the lens. The That's lens good. of the eye. Yes, yes. I like this. Um, when I think of the lens, I think of cataracts. Um, they're scaled on a up to four plus system. Is that correct? They are. And did several I? I'm different. just trying to get. I'm trying you to get got extra it. Credit here. Yeah. There's there's <laughs> nuclear sclerosis. That's kind of an age related. There's cortical cataracts, and they all have varying severity. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay. So so we got the lens, and so we're thinking uh, cataracts, and so we're mm -hmm. thinking. What are we thinking? So, I mean, not, I mean, I do, unfortunately, don't want to keep going back to the, the BDs, but the BDs, I do, I do think 
can accelerate the, the, <laughs> the sugars. I, like <laughs> I think it can accelerate. Oh, I just got that. I say, I diabetes, know, but, the I, there's so many medical words that I just don't know. I assumed that was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, the BDs. That you know. Got it. <laughs> I think I want to say I think that can accelerate the nuclear sclerotic sclerotic process, possibly. Absolutely. Nicely done. Yes, diabetes is um, some nuclear sclerosis, but also those other types of cataracts as well. Cortical cataracts, uh, posterior subcapsular cataracts. Oh, that's a fun um, one. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they affect different parts of the lens. But yes, high blood sugar for an extended period of time no can point cause the, the proteins in the lens to cloud over and huh. cause a cataract. So... The, the youngest people I've done cataract surgery on, because I don't do pediatric cataracts, but for adult cataracts, you know, people in their late 20s or 30s, mm. almost universally, they're type 1 diabetics who, you know, have just had high blood sugar for quite a while. They start developing a cataract. Hmm. So, do, Is there, yeah. not to get too academic, is there, do you see in, the, in that population with, with diabetes, with the cataracts, do they have a higher prevalence of retinopathy as well, or does it necessarily go together? No, it, it, it typically does go together. Yeah. So um, a lot of times they, they will have some retinopathy, varying degrees of it. But, you know, I've seen some very severe diabetic retinopathy, but cataracts have not formed. So they do hmm. go hand in hand, but Sometimes the cataract's a little bit worse. Sometimes the retinopathy's a little bit worse. So, Got it. Yeah. Well, I have to say before we, we switch gears here that I'm, I'm sensing in you something that I think might be relatable to others also in medicine. So um, I feel like you, well, I don't, you've just said it many times you, that you don't think you're smart. You don't think you're, you're smart enough. And I would like to disabuse you of that notion publicly here. Um, first of all, I feel like you don't need any, any justification of why, like, it's just obvious to anyone other than you, but here we are. So you've made it all the way through medical school, all the way through residency, all the way through whatever other training you've had. And now you are in one of the most complicated, I mean, who even knows about hormones? They do everything in there everywhere. Did you hear him say theochromocytoma? Yeah. I don't even know what that is and i probably couldn't even repeat it and i think that maybe what's happening is you know there's been a very stereotypical pathway through how you become a doctor historically um and i think that that is starting to change and that needs to change right that that there are many ways that people are intelligent first of all and um, you may not fit some mold that you had in your head of what being intelligent looks like, but you are very intelligent. And, and I can see in your videos, right, like I said, you're a natural educator. You can't be a natural educator if you don't understand things. You can't be, <laughs> you a natural, have to be, able you can't to be an educator and, and be a dumb dumb. Right, exactly. No. And then well, your you. artistic... Ability is obviously very great. And then your insights, you know, some of your, like you said, sometimes you have a view and your insights are, are, you know, also show signs of intelligence. So, you know, I come from the field of gifted education, so I have a little bit of authority to say so. <laughs> you are, you are an intelligent individual. And if there's others out there who maybe came to medicine through, you know, non-traditional paths, they might feel the same way. You guys are smart. You're smart. Thank you, Kristen. That that means a lot. And I, I feel like I owe you money for this session. I'd like to see you once a week. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> um, no, but you're you're right. And, you know, it took me a long time. I mean, I think imposter syndrome is very prevalent in our field. Yeah. Um, and it took me a long time to, you know, I, I feel more comfortable in my shoes these days. But I do like to use my platform and my story, my experience to do exactly what you just, exactly what you just said. And inform and kind of bolster the people in the beginning of this process because it's yeah. a, such a long dehumanizing exhausting process to say that you are and what makes you different is that going to make you actually a little bit stronger and in a better yes. position i think yeah. it does yeah and i sure. thankfully i think the tides are changing a bit in that direction of you know you don't want to be just this one dimensional person like you want to keep some hobbies we say that all the time you know keep some things that that you're passionate about that make you feel human uh, don't let medicine just like suck you dry of all of that stuff. 
And like you said, what makes you different? That's what's going to make you stand out. That's what's that in a good way, you know, being different right now in particular, I think is starting to be valued. So we need more artists in medicine. Yes. I we need also agree. we need more comedians in ophthalmology too. <laughs> I, I could I would appreciate some company here. You have that covered though, don't you? <laughs> All right, you let's got, take... you got to come out to New York and and get on stage. Oh, oh God, that would no, no, be no, no, fun. No. no way. That's see the thing. I call now myself. Here, here's his imposter oh, no, no, syndrome. No, no. Yeah, I do have an imposter syndrome when it comes to like calling myself a comedian. For a long time, I didn't, but I do get paid to tell jokes. So like, I guess technically I am a comedian. Uh, but to a very narrow audience, like, you know, so a lot of the stuff that I do comedy wise, if I went on a stage in like some, a random New York comedy club, I don't know if it would go well. I don't know. I'm going to push back on that. And I'm going to say that's your imposter syndrome speaking. And I, I think that I like you when I'm with my art friends, I identify as a doctor. And then when I'm with uh -huh. my doctor friends, I identify as an artist. It's that, it's that feeling mm -hmm. that you don't really, but you clearly have a talent. You clearly have a passion and I don't know, I think you'd crush it. And I also secretly want you guys to come hang out with me and my girlfriend in New York. So. Okay, fine, fine. I'll go to New York. I'll go to New York. I'll quit my job as an nope, ophthalmologist. Nope, nope. And, we'll uh, just go. We'll take a trip. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll be right back. All right, we are back with Dr. Mike Natter. I said it correctly you this did. time, Kristen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what, we're going to uh, take a look at a, a couple of our favorite medical stories or jokes that were sent in by the listeners. Uh, so we have uh, story number one comes from Steve. So Steve says, as I was being released from the hospital after a month following a heart attack, the hospital insurance ninja came to me and admitted defeat in getting my inpatient rehab covered even though the doctor restated the need for it. My wife told her, hand me the phone. Well, like this lady. Over the next 15 minutes, she turned into the greatest actress I had ever seen. She went through all stages of grief. She expressed denial, uh, patience, ang anger, confusion, even went full on mega Karen. It was stunning to behold. The insurance <laughs> company caved and paid for the two weeks. An hour later, the hospital administrator came in and offered her a job and a corner office. <laughs> I don't know if he's serious about that or not, but I, I would know. believe it. That, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure um, insurance is a big part of your life as an endocrinologist dealing with all these different medications, especially with diabetes. Well, and in your own medications. Yeah. yeah. yeah yes, absolutely. it is. It is. It is very, very frustrating. There has been some movement and some news, I'm sure you guys are aware that insulin has been dropped in terms of, of cost and capped uh, $35 a 35? month, uh, which yeah. is, it, it's, it's a, it's a move in the right direction, but it's still, you know, I, I believe that in, especially in type one diabetes, like no one did anything to get type one diabetes and they need a right. hormone to live. And when it was first, you know, kind of discovered by Banting in, in Canada back in 1923 or whatever it was, he sold the patent for a single dollar and said, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the people who need it. So the fact that people are making millions of dollars or billions of dollars and, and people are dying and rationing their insulin, that there's still ways to go. Yeah. That's yeah. A big problem. Ugh, it's disgusting. It's also one of the coolest medical stories is that he sold that patent for $1. Yeah. That's, and I'm sure he'd uh, be... Um, distraught at what it's turned into so which is pretty sad well keep up the uh the good work advocating for your patients and that's is that is that for all insurance like everybody 35 dollars is it certain I'm, I'm not as familiar with kind of this yeah this so thing, well so. the manufacturers very recently put out kind of like lower list prices and then um the government yeah. has kind of capped um like copay gotcha. insurance and stuff but it's still i mean there's still going to be pockets of the population that you know obviously are going to be overseen and, and not have that right. opportunity but, yeah yeah well our second uh story comes from jessica this is um a joke that she heard so <laughs> she says my neighbor is an ophthalmologist and i told her this joke my friend lost her eye in a tragic accident. She's having a hard time putting things into perspective. <laughs> we dark. need like a like a but um yeah sound effect. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. I've I've certainly told a spectacle joke from time to time. Mm, I, what's your spectacle joke? Oh, I, I I oh man, it was um 
there's something about uh, a patient being very angry and yelling at people in the lobby and uh, being told that they're making a spectacle of themselves. <laughs> but it's, you know. Uh, Dad jokes I, are. Not, yeah. See, the, uh, the reaction big. from Mike here, the little soft. <laughs> uh, like polite that's, laugh. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the exact reaction you should have to a joke like that. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you don't want your ophthalmologist to be too funny because they got they're like in your eye while you're laughing and then you move around and then it's a whole mess. That is you know? true. I, a good I, point. I have accidentally told jokes during surgery and sometimes that's an issue. So <laughs> accidentally told jokes. Yeah, well, is there an ICD-10 code for that? Accidentally, <laughs> accidental joke telling. Well, the thing is, you don't you don't want to try to be you don't want to be too the patient's awake, right? But you don't want to be too funny. Because they've also had some sedation, and so oh. uh, it so lowers lowers the threshold for um, the only yeah. time I'm funnier. Uh, the only time I'm more funny than if like the the audience has, has been drinking is when they've had like a little bit of Versed. Yeah, so, we, we may sense. have we may have a business plan here where we have the the nightclub comedy club just pumping oh, in Versed into the air a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> some aerosolized <laughs> sedation or nitrous. Nice. Re- there nitrous you go. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Now, before we finish up, uh, tell us you know, where people can find you. You got any projects, anything in the works? Sure. Yeah. So um, my social platform handle. So on Instagram, I'm Mike, M-I-K-E dot Natter. And like Nancy, A-T-T-E-R. On Twitter, I'm Mike underscore Natter. And I'm also on TikTok. I don't dance, though. I just draw a little bit. <laughs> And that's, that's I think that's just Mike Natter and, and TikTok. Yeah. So that's that's where you can find me. I'm hoping to make a book one day. It's going to happen eventually. Oh, that <laughs> Soon, would be cool. I hope. That would be, that's the plan. I mean, that's the hope, the dream. We'll see. And you also do sell prints of your art too. I think I've seen those as well. So if you're interested in checking out your art, you know, I encourage people to do that. You have yeah. to name your book someday. You have to name it after Natters, but it'll be Natters. Yeah. I, Natters. Yeah. I put a big A in there. I yeah. think you'd have a pretty good TikTok uh, presence if you keep keep posting, keep building up because people love like have like nice, you know, soft music playing behind your drawings. Mm-hmm. It's very relaxing. For you got people. a good voice think, for like yeah. a voiceover. I think explaining. Watching, watching people, I've seen some videos where you know watching people like write in calligraphy yeah. or a draw, and it's just like it's just fun to like just watch that. It's so, therapeutic. Yeah, it, it is a bit therapeutic, and and then you know you just. In, Learn instead, something you're, along the way too. You're drawing like kidneys and spleens and stuff. <laughs> exactly. So it's <that's> good. <laughs> All right. We'll keep up the great work. And uh, thanks again for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Have you ever wondered what happens when someone crashes their own funeral? Or heard about the man who stole $1.4 billion with a screwdriver? Have you ever lost sleep thinking about those death row inmates who had to play baseball or die? Actually, wait, that's weird. That's really weird. But even if you have, that's okay, because it means you're in the right place. Hi, my name is Andy Chang. You might know me from the internet and your phone. I tell stories, true stories, that are so fascinating, so unbelievably bizarre that I just have to share them. Just have to. Once a week on Hidden Stories, dive head first with me as we explore some of the most mind-boggling incidents, experiences, and people on this planet we call our home. Hopefully, we'll all come out of this with new perspectives on the world around us, as well as a much better understanding of what unbelievably unreal situations people can get themselves into. I can promise you this, no matter what books you've read or movies you've seen, the truth really is often far stranger than fiction. You just heard the trailer for a new podcast on the um, Human Content Podcast Network. That's right. Called Hidden Stories. So definitely check that out. I think it's... it's Sounds fun. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, you can subscribe now on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We had such a great time talking with Dr. Natter. Yes, he is did really... Did I really call him Natter? On you'd really once? did, yeah. Net, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, you know... That's what I heard it, anyway. I guess like we said, can listen. It's, it's a it's a a, a wonderful a comparison yeah. to have to a, one of the greatest artists in medicine. Very appropriate. Um, but yeah, it was a it was. I I just love when people continue to incorporate their hobbies, yes. the things they love to do outside of medicine into their medical. Uh, you know, career. Yeah, I, I, I think it's yeah. good for them as people. It's good for patients, and I think it helps bring more humanity into the field of medicine, which is something that we always. And you I'm know, serious try to, try about getting more comedian ophthalmologists out there. If you if you're out there, all right, 
let me know. Like, let's get together. Let's let's start work a on mentorship something. program or a, something. A mentorship <laughs> program for for comedian ophthalmologists. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you all also for sending in your stories. Do you have any stories to share? We'd love to hear them. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what we uh, talked about today. Uh, if you have thoughts about six degrees of endocrinology, uh, which I, I'm going to need to tweak it to explain it a little bit better. Yeah. I think. I think I didn't do a good job with that. I just came up with it like, you know. It works. It's like fine. Eight hours ago. I don't know. So anyway. Uh, I'll keep tweaking that. You just send us your. Uh, I love to hear st- like ideas for games too. If you because like uh, sometimes I rack my brain trying to come up with these things. Uh, there's lots of ways to hit us up. Email us knock knock high at human contentcom Hang out with us on social media: Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, YouTube. You can uh, also hang out with our human po- content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thanks to all the great listeners leaving wonderful feedback out there and the awesome reviews. We love seeing those reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Like Leslie T on YouTube said, thank you for all these informative interviews. We try to be, try to like make get people to laugh and enjoy themselves, but also be a little bit informative yeah, too. Yeah, edutainment. There, there you go. This is an edutainment podcast. Uh, also, uh, our full episodes of this podcast are up on YouTube every week at my YouTube channel at D We also have a Patreon, lots of cool, fun perks, bonus episodes, or react to medical shows and movies, hang out with other members of the knock, knock high community. We are there. We are posting and commenting and laughing along with you guys. Early ad free episode access, interactive Q and a live stream events, a lot more coming. Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of Patreon community perks, our new member, Jonathan A. We are uh, having, I love more, more people named Jonathan need to join the Patreon. That's, <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Uh, shout out to all the Jonathans on the Jonathan tier. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Stephen G, Rosk Box, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, Chaver W, and Jonathan A. Jonathan is a Jonathan now. Patreon Roulette, where we give a shout out to someone in the emergency medicine tier. Here we go. Shout out to April S for being a patron. Thank you, April S. We are your host, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glockenfleckens. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Mike Natter. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brook. Editor engineer is Jason Portizo, and our music is by Omer Binsvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you're going to start saying this too. I gotta share the spread the love a little bit with this uh, you know, speed talking. You're just getting lazy. You want me you to do that? You can go to glockandflecken.com or reach out to us at knockknockhi at human contentcom with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.